Shavua, Shavua Tov to everybody. I can't even begin to express to you how delighted I am to be here and to share with you the 60th anniversary of our beloved camp, Solomon Schechter. Now, I was trying to think of a way of illustrating to you what remarkable things can happen in a short period of time like 60 or 70 years. <laughs> Let me ask you to help me by creating in your mind's eye four word pictures that I'm going to share with you. Number one, in 1903, at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, two brothers, Wilbur and Orville Wright, came out on this beach along the Atlantic Ocean, schlepping with them a strange contraption looked like it was made up of bicycle parts. And it was, because they were the proprietors of a bicycle shop. And then they got in. And they performed one of the greatest miracles of all of history. Human beings, for the first time, flew like birds. They didn't rise very high, and they didn't fly very far, but they changed the world on that day. That's 1903. The next picture is something that I just went through again yesterday, coming up from Portland, and I passed Boeing Field. Now, none of us were in North Carolina in 1903. I think all of us have seen or visited Boeing Field. And what I saw there was a very familiar scene. On the tarmac were dozens of planes, modern jetliners, each one of them holding at least 100 people with a crew and a beautiful interior. Logos of countries from all over the world, every continent, Europe, Africa, Asia, North America, South America. The age of commercial aviation had come. Number three, go back to 1947. I was a student at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and I was determined that I wanted to go to Palestine. Those of you who remember that year know how momentous it was, and I wanted to be there. There was only one way that I could get to Israel from America. There was only one ship that brought passengers from America to Palestine. I wonder if any of you remember the name of that ship. The Marine Carp. It had been a troop ship carrier during the war. And now it was being used for commercial transportation. There were about a dozen cabins on that ship that had been used for the officers, and about 300 triple-decker beds were in the hull. And we traveled for over two weeks from New York 
to Haifa. It was a terrible trip. <laughs> we encountered Atlantic storms. Seasickness was rife. We had two Jewish funerals at sea of those who died along the way. Now, picture number four. In the 1960s or 70s, I don't remember the exact date, I was invited to come to Everett, Washington to be present at the delivery of the 747 to El Al. It was a thrilling sight to see that beautifully painted white and blue airplane swooping in and landing, and for years thereafter, I was able to fly from New York to Israel in 10 hours. The food was delicious. <laughs> the chairs were comfortable. It, wasn't, it didn't have the slightest resemblance to the marine carp. <laughs> All of that is to tell you how quickly the world changed in a short period of time. Now I'll tell you the story of Camp Solomon Schechter in the same way. I came from Lincoln, Nebraska to Portland, Oregon in 1953. I was determined that we create a Jewish camp in the Pacific Northwest. I had changed my entire career as a research chemist to become a rabbi because I went to Camp Brandeis. I wanted to be a part of a program to change the lives of other young Jews. I met my wife, Goldie, at Brandeis Camp and we're celebrating our 71st wedding anniversary. I'd like, I'd like to see the same thing happen to young people in the Pacific Northwest. But I needed a partner. I couldn't do it by myself as a rabbi in Portland. So I turned to my colleague, Rabbi Joe Wagner, in Seattle. He had never been in camp before, but he was enthusiastic about the idea. So we decided to start a Jewish camp. This was in Echo Lake in North Seattle around 72nd Street. It was an abandoned motel. It had been abandoned for several years. It had a little lake there, but nothing uh, f to conduct swimming uh, on that lake. The only sport facilities that we had was a cow pasture <laughs> with cows. <laughs> we laid out four bases and uh, others to play softball. There was no kitchen and there was no large room to accommodate even the 25 first campers. For a full week, all of our lunches and all of our dinners were sandwiches. <laughs> Outdoors, on tables and chairs that we brought from Congregation Herzl, Rabbi Wagner's congregation. It was the most dismal physical setting <laughs> possible to begin a camp, but it was wildly successful. We lived Jewishly, and everyone there was enthusiastic about that experience. We got up in the morning to sing Hatikva. We had davening in the morning. We had a kosher meals all the time. 
we played a Jewish game that we brought from Israel called Gaga. <laughs> it became the game at Camp Solomon Schechter. When camp ended, after the first week, there was such enthusiasm and excitement, of course we were going to do it again. The following summer, we went back to Echo Lake, this time for two weeks. And this time, we put up a huge tent for dining purposes, for program purposes. We made other amenities in the camp. Again, a wonderful success. But we couldn't continue at Echo Lake and expand our program. Fortunately, Rabbi Wagner saw in the newspaper an announcement that Seattle Pacific University had bought Camp Casey on Whidbey Island and was looking for tenants to rent out during the summer. Well, Joe and I drove out to Whidbey Island, fell in love with what we saw. It was an abandoned, everything started out abandoned. <laughs> it was an abandoned army base, Camp Casey, going back to Civil War days. It was huge. They had huge buildings, barracks building. They had a gymnasium. Uh, they had a building that we could use for a chapel. And so we signed a lease for the following summer at Camp Casey. But one thing was missing. There was no place to swim, nothing to swim in. But we were determined. And uh, Rabbi Solomon and I were driving around that part of Whidbey Island, and we came across a an abandoned quarry <laughs> which had water in it. We, we had the water tested, and it passed the test. <laughs> then we had a problem. How do we get kids from Camp Casey to the quarry? We found at Camp Casey an old school bus. And can you imagine, Rabbi Stamfer spent a whole week learning to drive a school bus. <laughs> and I still remember the feeling. Going forward was no problem. <laughs> but going in reverse was a fright. <laughs> but we did it. And we took the kids, and we were very careful about uh, uh, their readiness to go swimming in this quarry pond. And after a, a while, Rabbi Solomon got the idea of building a raft so they could have some water sports. And he took the Mahone group and they built a raft. And they put up a mast and they put up a sail. Sail, S-A-I-L. <laughs> and and they named that raft with a big sign, Lama Lo. <laughs> Why not? We can do anything that we want to set out to do. Why not? Give it a try. That became, really, in my mind, the second slogan of Camp Solomon Schechter. The first of them were Judaism and joy are one. And the next one, la malo, why not? We can do anything we want to do. Well, we were there on Whidbey Island for, for a number of years, about 11, 12 years. It was wonderful. To this day, everybody who was a camper on Whidbey Island remembers the wonderful spirit that we experienced there. But, we were the only residents of Camp Casey. We had the whole place to ourselves. We made programs that we created and enjoyed. 
And we even pressured Seattle Pacific University to build a beautiful swimming pool. A big mistake. When they built that swimming pool and did some refurbishing of Camp Casey, all of a sudden they started holding classes there and they were inviting all kinds of groups to come. The Seattle Sonics, how many of you remember the Seattle Sonics? <laughs> they had a basketball camp at Camp Casey. They had church camps at Camp Casey. They had crippled children's camps at Camp, Camp Casey. We finally felt, began to feel, that we were back in some town or other. It wasn't a, our camp anymore. We had to find another one. So we found an advertisement again for the sale of Trails End Camp in Tumwater, Washington. And we went to look at it. And I remember that wet, wintry day that we saw it. And I fell in love with it at first sight. Now remember, this was an abandoned camp. <laughs> it was. The owner of the camp was Helen Shank. And she had, a couple of years before, broken her hip and had to give up the camp. She kept the stables, uh, uh, Trails End stables, on the other side of the camp. After we bought the camp, we had to raise money. We sold debentures. We raised, uh, I think it was about $260,000 to buy the camp. And then discovered we couldn't get to the camp ground <laughs> because the only road that existed went through and passed the stables and it was no longer available to us. So what did we do? Lama Lo. We built a road to the camp. To this day, that's the only access to Camp Solomon Schechter, that road cutting down trees, uh, pulling up tree trunks, graveling it. One man did it with a bulldozer, Fred Shepard, our caretaker at that time. We built the road. We, we, we built uh, a meeting hall, the Beit Knesset, and we were building improvements on the other buildings that already existed there. I remember so well, on the very first day, when campers arrived at camp in the bus, I was on the roof of the girls' cabin nailing down the shingles on the roof. And I had to get off the roof to welcome the campers. But we were on our way. And every year, we did whatever we could to improve the camp. And the spirit was La Malo. When I felt that we ought to have, of all things, water skiing at the camp, I went out and bought a motorboat. And we did that for years. Some of you, I'm sure, went water skiing on the camp. It was a thrill. I wanted to have horseback riding. I made arrangements with Trails End Stables, and we had a regular program of horseback riding. Eventually, we had to give up both activities for very specific reasons, which I don't have the time to get into. <laughs> but I want to point out how fortunate I felt after I retired, after spending 25 summers direct uh, consecutively at camp to be able to welcome Sam Perlin to the camp who's performed remarkable feats of development at the camp because he has it within him, the spirit of La Malo. Why not? 
if he wanted kids to be able to fly over the camp, uh, to have uh, the, the, the experience of Batman, <laughs> he put in a cable over the camp and kids could fly over the camp. He wanted the kids to have an experience in Israel. He created Camp Solomon Schechter in Israel, a wonderful experience for them. He wanted the kids to have an opportunity to go rock climbing. He put up a, a climbing wall at the camp. We did the most unusual things under that kind of inspired leadership until our camp became indeed one of the premier Jewish camps in the entire country. Now, we have launched a program to make the camp even better. When that program will be successfully completed, I think very much that we will have really the finest camp in the United States. Now, why do I feel that way? Because we live in the Pacific Northwest. We're a part of the country that does great things because it has that kind of determination. After all, where I come from, the University of Oregon football team is one of the premier football programs in America. And I, I would suspect that we very well be, may be the number one football team of all the colleges in America. And I'm in Seattle right now. And the Seattle Seahawks became the Super Bowl champions of the world. We can do it. We have done it. La Malo, why not? And I'm really, I'm thrilled to be here for the 60th anniversary, and I'm looking forward, God willing, to being here for more anniversaries and see greater accomplishments. La Malo, why not?